Okay, I think we're ready to go. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today at uh, APT. Uh, for our new friends attending an APT event for the first time, uh, APT stands for Architectural Practice Talks, and uh, we're an uh, online and offline community of uh, creative minds in architecture, design, and urbanism. Uh, we create programs including interviews, set visits, and lecture series. Uh, APT began in a tiny apartment in New York uh, in 2014, and uh, currently we have uh, chapters in New York, Chicago, and uh, Shanghai. Today is the, four, uh, is the 41st event of APT New York, and uh, we are more than honored to have uh, Leo uh, and Ya Yun from MVRDV Next to share with us their practice and the research in computation tooling. Uh, be, because they're actually joining us from Rotterdam, Netherlands. This is also the very first time APD has hosted the event on three separate continents. Uh, as you might know, MVRDV is well known for its research-based design methodology, uh, which generates experimental and very bold architectural solutions. Uh, next is the uh, research and development group at MVRDV, empowering its creativity. Uh, today, Leo and Ya Yun will discuss how next contributes to uh, the studio's global practice. Uh, through a series of case studies, they will showcase the new tools and data-driven decision-making process that's being uh, explored at MVRDV Next. So welcome, Leo and Ya Yun. Thank you. Thanks for Thank the you, kind introduction. Yes, okay, so then let's, uh, we can dive right into it. The title of the talk is How Good Are We? And indeed we wanna address um, contemporary urgencies that we see in the shift of how architectural practices work today and how we work at MBRDV and um, how we try to contribute or how to address these uh, challenges through computational design and digital tool making. We will do this in three parts. And we'll start by first introducing the practice of MBRDV very briefly. So you can see the mission of MBRDV is to create social, innovative, realistic, and green remarkable architecture for a changing world. And especially the keyword of realistic, I guess, is becoming increasingly important now that we also work a lot on making buildings, complex buildings and ambitious buildings uh, feasible. The practice was founded by Vinny Maas, Nathalie De Vries and Jakob van Reis and is currently at 290 plus employees from I think around 40 countries all over the world. We have projects, uh, I think we recently hit project 1000, we're now around 1100 projects in the history of the office. And uh, some of the earlier ones that you might know, or might have seen somewhere, including the BPAO building in Hilversum, the Dutch pavilion, Expo pavilion at uh, Expo 2000 in Hanover, the Silo Dam residential building in Amsterdam, the market hall more recently in our, our hometown Rotterdam, um, Tianjin library, uh, the Seoul Skyway, and many, many more projects. In addition to that, we also publish research and um, publish findings projects, both uh, standalone with MBRDB, but then also in collaboration with, for instance, the Y Factory, which is our think tank in the TO Delft. And um, these are our four offices by right now. So we have the main office in Rotterdam. We have um, satellite offices in Shanghai, Paris, and recently Berlin. Uh, which have what execution technical um, uh, phases of projects towards realization. Uh, yes, that's our headquarters in Rotterdam. So today we want to talk about this uh, in three phases or in three steps. The first one is looking back. So how did um, what how did Next in a way originate out of MVRDV and how, in my opinion, did it, could it not have come out of any other practice? So what are the roots of MVRDV within data-driven design and uh, how did that get us to the establishment and now to the operations of MVRDV Next? In the second step, we want to look um, a little bit at contextualizing. So what are the urgencies, especially in digitalization of um, design and construction? And in the third part we want to, which will be the main part of the talk, we want to show how we try to at MVRDV Next, how to, to address these urgencies in applied architectural projects uh, in standalone research that we do within MBRDV and MBRDV Next, but then also in collaboration with different academic institutions. And after that, we'll have some time to hear your questions. So if we like start with the look back where we came from, 
what we can see is that uh, MBADV in a way has always been an office that uh, has been driven by an attempt to understand the world in numbers. So data-driven design in a way has been in the origins of the practice since the uh, previous millennium. And that's uh, of course emphasized in projects like uh, publications like Pharmax, which were exp explorations essentially purely on densification on potential of um, yeah, square meters or capacities uh, on sites. But then in our opinion, maybe most um, in its most radical form, we can see this in the project Metacita Data Town, which is um, a speculation on a city in the future that is based purely upon data. So in a way, it attempts to remove any kind of spatial or compositional questions uh, from, from, the, from this construct and purely ask how much, how much do we need in terms of residential area? How much do we need in terms of waste depository? How much how in, in terms of construction materials and so on? And in a way, it turns it from a spatial question into a numerical question. And you could say that it uh, was maybe a predecessor towards uh, current BIM technologies. And similarly, we have Pig City, a project from 2001, which was a radical speculation on Dutch agriculture, where you see that it basically attempts to take Dutch landscapes into overall um, surface that is needed for agricultural production and ask what if we densify this and what if we cluster it into these essentially two high rises that mark and can like absorb the entire area on land that is needed to um, produce um, the food of the Netherlands in two landmarks. And you can see that uh, here it does generate um, new unexpected spatial qualities for all actors involved. And what we see is uh, that in, in parallel at the same time, in a way to realize or to visualize these kind of um, radical projects, MBRDV also has always been looking into tool making both analog and digital here of course for in our context the interest is more on the digital side and we can see that uh, around the same time in i think early 2000 the visions of space fighter rhine Ruhr city and then more recently in the village maker and house maker amongst others what we can see so space maker was a, in a way a multiplayer game in which you would negotiate between uh, others in a kind of voxelated virtual space and try to expand your territory against them the village maker um, again, looking into kind of uh, mechanisms of participation and um, and negotiation was looking into how to densify um, within a very constrained environment and how to maximize individual desires and individual spatial qualities within that space. So we developed a design tool that would in real time evaluate the impact of your building within uh, surroundings according to quantifiable um, parameters such as views, daylight, access, structural requirements, area, and, and to some extent economics. And then on the larger scale, this was blown up towards the region maker, which was a working software on a vox laced terrain that was negotiating different forms of landscapes. And uh, yeah, house maker, okay, I think there's something Get messed up a bit in the order here, but Housemaker again, then on a smaller scale, was looking into a kind of a configurator, which I guess nowadays we see coming up uh, in, in many places as actually working software on the internet, as something where people could design uh, in rather intuitively their own apartments, which then would be later fed into this village maker that I was showing previously. So in a way here, this was preempting moves towards everyone becoming their own designer and to be becoming their own architect. But then what we see, of course, is the shift from this kind of software, which required a lot of people to, from specialists to program it, to architects to, uh, and graphic designers to conceptualize it and develop it. What we can see is that, of course, the software has been developing uh, very rather rapidly. And nowadays, pretty much every standardized uh, CAD software that architects are using has extensions that allows, allows them to program and script and be customized. We can see that, of course, on the level of Rhino and the parametric extension Grasshopper. You have it in Revit with Dynamo and more recently also Rhino Insight. And of course, also with more standardized or universal programming languages such as Python and so on. So what this allows us is then rather going from this conceptualizing a software to visualize or calculate the impacts of an architectural or urbanistic vision, we can go to what we call instant tooling where we can conceptualize 
different kinds of software every day and where we can evolve them and where we can take them from one project to another and crossbreed them and evolve. And out of this kind of, um, I guess, acceleration of um, the abilities to develop your own workflows at MBADV, we at some point uh, started, I think around three years ago, MBADV Next, which is an acronym for New Experimental Technologies. We are currently a group of uh, five people. So Yayun and me were two of the early members. And if we see that MBRDV is doing this kind of, like I guess can be described in its output in this kind of different um, buildings, build realities towards um, different functions, we can see that at the back end, basically what we are doing at MBRDV next is evaluations, quantification, we're looking into an interactive design, how can we speed up processes and decision-making? We're looking into simulating the impacts of designs on the environment. We're looking into extending the understanding of a design context with data scapes, but then also, of course, on a very important part, we're looking into rationalization of design ambitions, we're looking into automating workflows, into improving workflows, and essentially at the end, making ambitious design projects buildable and feasible and affordable. So we have five people at the moment. Yeah, um, Sana and me, uh, I think, co-founded MVRDV Next around three or four years ago. And then we're joined very quickly by Baudewein, Yayun, and Jaka. And I guess this is our mission statement as MBRDB Next. We primarily, or we were originated out of the ambition to contribute and support ongoing projects at MBRDB with customized workflows. So specific digital solutions towards um, yeah, specific design tasks within those projects. And from that, we now graduate. So from a part-time contribution to different projects, we grew into this group of five people who are now working um, also on standalone research and collaborating with different universities all around the world. And um, going to the second part where we want to talk a little bit about our ongoing interests, the question of um, design quantification is, I guess, going towards the foreground, which is probably an experience that we can all share here in, in this panel. So. When we look back at this dream, at this vision of spatial kind of unforeseen and expecting um, configurations, we can see that the reality today is uh, rather going towards um, BIM management and uh, the management of large, large uh, long numerical tables. So the role of the architect in a way is, uh, is changing in a way that maybe was not fully along the line of, of this dream that was articulated nearly 20 years ago. And what we then ask ourselves is like, if in, if digital tools allow us to quantify and assess the impact of buildings on the environment in earlier in earlier design stages, uh, we get to a point where we can see that this kind of quantification mechanisms are in a way unbeatable by the ways we talk about architecture or the design intents and this idea of a master sketch or some form of brilliant intuition of the architect that at some point you present like architectural visions and renders and extended concept diagrams but then these last three pages that um, hold schedules and areas will always be the thing that drives decision making processes and this is um, what interests us a lot that we think that this question of quantification in a way is something that is unavoidable now that we have the ability to do to quantify designs but then the question is, what do we quantify and how do we quantify it? And this is uh, something where we are not alone. Of course, we see this in ongoing developments like Sidewalk Labs, the subsidiary company of Alphabet that recently launched a design tool called Delve, which aims to automate design and um, is able to generate millions and millions of configurations within nearly uh, instantaneously. And then how do you browse and how do you navigate all of these solutions? through a rather limited set of uh, quantifiable parameters, which you can see here, which as a designer, the only thing that you can do with this is prioritize them or um, outweigh them against each other. But you can't even go into the software to the point of de developing your own definition of sun hours or qualities of use or desirable um, access to green, like where, where do you want to go and so on. And equally, you see the similar things happening with SpaceMaker at Autodesk, um, again, at the like a rather sophisticated, technically sophisticated so, uh, software that looks at automating uh, space and 
uh, and design. And then again, overwhelming a designer with these millions of solutions uh, to the point where, again, you need to quantify it in a rather limited set in order to even make sense of which are preferable design options to go to. And even at MVADV, we are, have been, or at MVADV Next, we've been doing similar things. We'll show this a bit later in detail um, as well. This is a project uh, that we developed in Paris, the CERDEC, where we also we brute forced different configurations of typical floor plants and got to, I think, a set of 60,000 plants where we are faced essentially with the same question of how do you navigate and how do you prioritize within this? And not surprisingly, we ended up with a very similar set of quantifiable parameters, which is uh, the structural costs, amount of terraces, amount of views, GFA or floor area. And uh, then you can prioritize and see which of these values should be maximized in order to filter the preferable design solutions. So out of this, one of the projects that we will show a bit later in the presentation is a research that we started um, with a workshop together with Tsinghua University in Beijing, which is this question, how good are we? Which is also the title of the talk. And how good means here, like in how good are we as architects with the projects that we do in quantifiable parameters? So can we measure goodness? And if yes, like how, what does that mean? What uh, words can, or what criteria can good be substituted with? Um, in the next part, we want to address this kind of question and we will show, um, as I mentioned earlier, we will show how we address that within MBRTV next in three uh, sections, applied projects, which will be a few case studies of recent projects at MBRTV, uh, one research project, recent research project that we did within MBRTV next and two academic uh, collaborations. So initially, like the first and in a way also the origins of MBRDB Next were um, that we collaborate with the entire office on project specific solutions. So MBRDB in general, you have to imagine is structured as uh, within eight uh, studios, um, which work and operate in different geographical contexts of, uh, of the world. And as Next uh, among, sorry, so with, um, within that studio, you have these eight, uh, within MBRDB, you have these eight studios and you have different specialisms. Uh, one of them is us as, in terms of computation. You also have specialisms for sustainability, uh, specialisms for ma materials and construction, specialisms for BIM and so on. And what we do is we collaborate with all of these studios and make sure that we can transfer and exchange knowledge and tools that we develop uh, amongst the different design studios. So a few projects, few case studies. The first one is a master plan in, uh, for a garden show in Almere in the Netherlands, close to Amsterdam, which is pretty much on the way and will be opening next year. It's called Floriade, and it's a competition that was won more than 10 years ago. And what we did within Next is like that we collaborated with um, two landscape offices, one from the municipality of Almere, plus one private landscape office. And over the course of several years, they developed this large um, data set of species. So as a garden show, the concept of MBRDB was to have an alphabetical sequence from plants starting with A on the top left corner towards plants and uh, starting with Z on the bottom corner. And as this list was collected and as this list was growing, we developed a workflow that would um, combine these data sets from these different um, landscape offices and constantly update this uh, model that looks like an illustrator drawing, but is actually a computational model in Rhino. And here you can see a bit, so the central element was an Excel spreadsheet, which then gets read out. And we can test very quickly different configurations in how dense plants should be placed, uh, um, different symbiosis and different uh, aversions between different species. And um, we could quickly test different configurations as this data sets were evolving. Yeah, parameter blocks and so on. The next project I already showed briefly, La CRDC. So here um, we worked together with MBRDB's uh, design team in, for French projects, and they developed a set of seven uh, standardized floor plans, which were complying with most of the requirements for residential buildings in France. And what we were mostly interested here is, uh, can we model or can we analyze 
what kind of qualities are can be generated when these different floor plans get stacked vertically. Um, so we generated, I think, in this video, you see six and a half thousand. In the end, with the final set of floor plans, we had something like 60,000 unique floor plans. And then the question becomes, how can we filter? How can we navigate this uh, huge solution space? And we developed our own visual interface, which you can see on the left side, where you could essentially draw your own curve of priorities. And then the algorithm would find design solutions that would match that or approximate that as much as possible. So the blue curve is one that's drawn by the designer. The red one is the closest result within the solution space. And then I think we see the top 20 in gray behind that. And then maybe last architectural project that's uh, currently under construction is the Valley in Amsterdam. And here maybe we can go a bit into detail of um, our role in the project which was after the competition was won, um, basically making this rather complex uh, geometry buildable. It's a mixed use building in uh, uh, Amsterdam's CBD, Central Business District in the south of Amsterdam. And um, on the middle, top middle, you see what was basically required by the Gemeente, the municipality of Amsterdam, and then MBRDB's concept, which is this kind of, yeah, rocky irregular shape of this dissolving of these three towers into one continuous landscape um, with maximizing daylight uh, qualities for all three residential towers and while this was randomized in the competition stage this was a project where we together with Aro uh, were working on making it buildable and you can see that uh, essentially there was a daylight simulation that we developed both for the interior as well as for the facades and at the same time, also there were daylight requirements, legal requirements by the municipality that were also fed into this algorithm. All of this together as criteria could then be uh, evaluated both in the summer case where shading in residential buildings is desired, but then also maximizing sun in the winter case where you would want to get the energy and the, the daylight. And when you in a way, pit these two requirements for day for summer and winter against each other. You get into this kind of uh, configurator that explores endless variations and also contain um, limit solutions to certain angles for um, rational facade standard standardized angles for keeping it buildable. And we again we get into this infinite uh, pool of design solutions that can be navigated and where a designer can, I guess, pick from it and also in the next step manually modify this and extend it further. That's what we can see here. So once a solution is picked, in the next step, you can still manually fine tune that. And that's, of course, something that's also important within the way that we work at MBRDB that you maintain this kind of um, control as a designer. And then in the next step, once the form finding was done, we brought this model from uh, Rhino into Revit and of course extended um, together in this huge uh, group of collaborators with um, technical advisors, MEP and, um, and structural engineers. And had a huge Revit model that, um, that was continued to be developed. And then in the next stop at MBRDB, uh, we were tasked with the question of designing a facade for this building. And that's something where the regular half zone pattern would have been applied, but in our case, what we really wanted was an irre irregular pattern. And um, that's what you can see on the right in order to maintain this kind of natural or maybe more organic or irregular surprising quality. And this is something where no design off the shelf design tool was available for that. So again, we were tasked with either we develop something ourselves or we have to go back to this half zone pattern on the left, which is what contractors were familiar with um, building it. And in order to do that at the time without a Rhino Insight, we basically had to bring the, the model from Revit back into Rhino and into Grasshopper to develop our own algorithm for form finding of this composition of this irregular facade. And then um, doing that basically by developing our own kind of BIM interface, as you can see with unique IDs for each of the uh, facade lines. And in a way, this is the representation of the result. So this is a elevation view of the building only in start and end points of these facade lines of the, uh, of the stone cladding. And um, this is the, the script that we developed in order to do this. 
And here you can see how, as a designer, how you would interact with it. So we have the wireframe model of the building. You develop, you choose an area in which you want to uh, design the facade composition. It starts or offers a first random composition. And then you can select an, a specific area and either wait for the algorithm to suggest new solutions or manually change, um, um, adjust some of the numbers and find and, and design it uh, in a way more manually. At the same time, then, of course, you at all at all times in the process, there is a um, an evaluation tab in which you can see uh, the overall distribution of different length and also error checks and uh, and so on. And this is then this evaluation tab that I managed I mentioned where you can see different lengths and different heights and then how far we can manage to reduce costs and um, standardize the composition of these panels. And then, of course, as a next step, we had to bring this back from Rhino into Grasshopper. You can see that we developed a custom family and then um, developed Dynamo scripts that would read out this data set from, from Rhino. The building is currently under construction. We topped out and reached the highest point, and uh, most of the facade is applied as well. Yeah, Yun, I think at this point I'll hand over for you to you. Yes. Okay, so the next case study uh, is an urban design project we did in 2017 to 2018 for Tencent. Uh, can I control your screen? Oops. So the site is located in the famous uh, Shanghai in Shenzhen. Like it has been the hotspot for international competition for many years. And our site is in this uh, peninsula uh, with this container port and uh, where Tencent wants to develop its next headquarter to an entire city uh, consisting of both offices and their residential buildings and some dormitories. So we look into the evolution of Tencent and uh, like with their growing business and uh, their expansion in this app development. But in terms of the space, uh, we see a correlation. Uh, I think it's a bit delayed. Leo, can you just help me to push next? Yeah. So, so in the beginning, like Tencent 1.0, we all know that when Pony Ma and his uh, uh, colleagues like in the 90s, they were still in the room of a random building in Shenzhen, and then they moved into this uh, a few floors in a rented office building. And then finally, in Tencent 3.0, they have their own headquarters as a high rise. And lately, they have the, the, their current headquarters is this Tencent 4.0, which is a connected towers. We call it an urban village. And uh, the next will be evolved into a whole city next. So as Pony Ma mentioned in several lectures, like Tencent focuses on this uh, connection a lot next. And then uh, it's our role to find out how to connect their key uh, values, green, smart, and culture. So in terms of our concept, I will just quickly go through this part. So here is our site. We extend the water landscape and we put these roads underground. And then we put some inlets for traffic nodes. And then uh, we emphasize the uh, urban views and the waterfront views. And then we insert the public nodes. And then we extend the landscape to the waterfront. And we raise the uh, volume. And then we cut, like we apply a orthogonal grid to the whole master plan. And here we have the main, uh, here we have the variation of building size according to the uh, skyline. And this step is a key step. So we want to apply a dynamic mountain range skyline surface to the whole, whole site to, to create a holistic image for the enterprise. And then uh, we, input some uh, culture type for the bigger plots and then some special buildings yeah some, some terraces with this uh, war room space and then we put some uh, solar solar scape uh, no solar panels on the top of the building some void inside the buildings for the better volumes 
this and here the solar panels uh, covering here and there. It's like the peak of the mountains. And in the lower part, we just uh, put some uh, plants. It's like a natural, like a mountain when you grow with the uh, level, the landscape is also changing and we add some bridges to the to connect. It. So this is our uh, overall concept of the master plan. And then, so yeah, so here we have the volumes. Uh, this is the holistic skyline, some special buildings in between. So it's quite clear that about the design gesture, but uh, what's interesting for us as MLD Next is how to, uh, how to create a criteria because in the design process, there has been a lot of uh, design variations. Uh, so, so the, the, the question is to know as, as the title of this lecture, how good are we? And we created so many variations and we have to find ourselves a way to know which one is better than the other ones and what are the criteria. So we start to uh, make such a evaluation table so on the right side, we list out all the buildings or the campus, and we have a label for them, a dashboard, like what is the GFA, the height, and the irregularity of it. And also on this, uh, this, this field chart, it, this chart is about the uh, footprint size, because for the office, uh, office type, maybe they are more interested in this uh, 2,000 square meter uh, size of the footprint. And then this one is about the corner angle of the building. So in the middle is 90 degrees. So on the left side is too sharp and on the right side is too big. So in a way, the more you concentrate on this center part, the more regular you have in the, for the buildings. And then this chart is about how much GFA you have achieved for the lower part. So the more fatter the graph is, then the more GFA is more uh, concentrated on the peak. And then this this one is about the uh, evaluation of the of the skyline surface. So we we set this uh, method up, and then we start to make some variations. You can see in the beginning there's uh, there's no uh, orthogonal uh, patterns, so uh, so the street is quite uh, organic. Which in this uh, corner angle diagram you can see the corners are not concentrated here. And until the last version, like this range 5.0, we finally tried to, uh, because the client was raising a lot of questions about the irregularity of the building, and we finally agreed to use a uh, orthogonal street pattern. And suddenly we can see immediately from the graph that most of the buildings have a 90 degree corner angle. And also the footprint, they are now more concentrated on the preferable footprint size. So by showing this, uh, we are on the one hand, we are optimizing for ourselves, but on the other side, we are also uh, trying to convince, give the uh, client a more convincing message of, the, of our proposal. Next. Yeah, so here is a quick uh, <clears throat> comparison, next. So this is actually behind the scene, like uh, the uh, grasshopper and rhino walking screenshots of this, uh, this uh, evaluator script. Next. And this is an overview of all the parameters we are able to adjust. And then these uh, black highlighted uh, outlines are the ones we recommend to fix there. And then this is our recommended uh, combination of this uh, these parameters next. So the first one is about how rough, how how undulating you want to have for this uh, skyline surface. You can have it either completely flat, and then you can slightly make it more hilly and more and more, and more and more hilly, and finally it's completely crazy. And the next uh, next slider is about the block size. So you can have it either very big or very small or like more narrow or this is more straight line. This is about the serpentine profile along the, uh, along the waterfront. So you can have it uh, very flat or more and more invading into the inner part of the master plan. <clears throat> then this is about the street pattern. 
So it can range from uh, very orthogonal to very uh, distorted. <clears throat> so this is about the <clears throat> program distribution. And you can go from <clears throat> very, <clears throat> sorry. Very de <clears throat> divided to uh, very mixed. So this is about the roof solar panel. <clears throat> and then this, uh, this is about the shrinking of the solar part to more terrace like. And then this is a <clears throat> overview of all our sliders. Next. So our impressions about the master plan. <clears throat> the, the war room, the street with dynamic life, and this is the skyline. Uh, so <clears throat> we also work independently on stability research. Uh, so we develop a project independent research on a regular basis. In most cases, there are research camps results in reports and computational tools for internal use at MRDB, like this uh, solar scape, project scape, and carbon scape. And this is uh, <clears throat> the solar scape project we have developed uh, in 2019. Uh, so in Rotterdam, we know it's a dense city, and then Rotterdam people is not satisfied about that. So in the future, Rotterdam municipality wants to densify the city even more. So according to this uh, Hofbau VC, the high-rise version. Uh, next. <clears throat> so 100,000 apartments are planned to be added to the city's building stock, and the height can go up to 200 meters. And it must be exciting for the developers because whatever you see in the red envelope, it's a flying money. But as a citizen, you might be worried that the streets and parks will get very dark. So the municipality said it's true that the yellow parts are the sunspots that cannot be um, projected shadow by the future development of the high rise. So in a way, it's a very smart idea because it does not impose absolute uh, constraints. For example, the policy could simply say you cannot build higher than the higher than the highest point of the church. Instead, it says as long as you can't cast too much shadow on the sand spots, you can do whatever you want as a developer. So which we can call it a performative constraints. So as a result, more urban developing potentials are released from one single curse. So in the, so as an example, we, the developers might still say it's to an abstract class. So here we try to illustrate the idea for you. So first, what if we visualize the uh, policy in 3D? So the first step is like as a developer, you can build up to 200 meter on a given plot. And then here you have the uh, next, and then here you have the sunspot next to your plot. And then we check uh, which part inside your 200 meter envelope are blocking the sun from the sunspot. And then we uh, remove these uh, tubes accordingly. <clears throat> so this is how the sunspot's policy going to have uh, impacts on your business if you are a developer. So, so actually it's a negotiation model, which uh, the developer and the municipality have different interests. As a developer, you are more interested in the maximizing the developable area. And for the <clears throat> municipality, it's about uh, uh, have a preferable city, 3D city as an indirect result. So to help <clears throat> the two stakeholders better understand the policy and negotiate uh, with each other, uh, next uses this tool to establish a feedback loop that visualizes and quantifies negotiation between the two. Next. 
So here it comes uh, the cool part. We run the visualization for the entire 3D city. And we start with the 200 meter extrusion envelopes. And then it, if the sun policy comes into effect with a tolerance of 60 minutes of the shadows, uh, rather than will be dense like this. And if, if the policy becomes a stricter in a way with only 15 minute tolerance for the shadows, uh, we can see the buildable envelope becomes uh, less. And then if there's a no negotiable tolerance at all, then can we even call it a city without shadow? So we can further map the index of the development opportunity. So here you can see in the map, the red part are more hot uh, spots for the developments because there is not still a lot of space to densify. But if you look at the blue ones or the green ones, they are less interesting for developers because they are so already fully occupied and there's no space to, to go. And uh, also, next. And also, the sun policy, the sunspot policy is not fully fixed. So, what if we have a different uh, sunspot set up, then you end up with a different protodon? So is it a better rather than? So here you can see we are trying to change from a linear uh, development follows policy mode uh, to a more like negotiable feedback loop. And we make a short video to explain this. So here you can see we analyzed all the buildings the, with the high rise potential to see how many voxels, how many pixels are already occupied there and how many can still be built so if the rather than becomes a city of sun, what it will look like. So here you can see the white part are the existing volumes and all the orange part are the potential uh, buildable envelope, which you can build inside there, but you can still have uh, no negative uh, impact on the sunspots. And we have uh, presented this uh, proposal to the Rotterdam municipality and uh, they are very interested in it. And uh, we are going to the next stage of our collaboration. So maybe what's interesting or important to add here is that this is um, in a way this policy is already in effect since uh, 2018, but there were no tools for architects, urbanists and designers to, to really evaluate whether new design proposals are actually complying with these regulations. So in a way that we, we lack the tools to understand and, and measure the impact of proposals on this level. And this is what this um, SolarScape project, research project of MBRDB Next aimed to do, to visualize yeah. this, this potential and also to, of course, help in early feasibility studies with new design projects to visualize this, what we call possibility envelopes within which um, or opportunity envelopes within which the development can be can be designed. <clears throat> and for the so, next chapter, uh, like apart from the applied projects between the office and these independent researches we do at NEXT, we also collaborate with academic institutions to gain new insights. As Leo mentioned earlier, like we started this How Good Are We idea with this uh, Tsinghua EPMA students with the English program of master at Tsinghua. And we, we did this workshop next with uh, 28 international students from different place in the world. So the first question we have in mind is that it will be very interesting to understand how different cultural background uh, defines uh, differently what is the good. And the secondly, if you can define them, can you quantify them? So the, for the, it's a three week workshop. So for the first week, we are asking uh, each of them to propose your dream. So what is uh, good according to you as a criteria for the for architecture? And next, and so, so we are using this uh, real-time mirror collaboration online tool 
and each of them are making this a mini uh, square. They put their dream and the reference image and why they think it's important there. And then uh, next from there, we try to formulate a teams according to their common uh, interest. So we have seven um, groups of uh, seven, seven goals. And then they, they have this, uh, for example, here is about how symbi symbiotic are we. So for them, the symbiotic is uh, their most important criteria for good architecture. Next. Yeah, also some, uh, some real-time uh, tooling uh, tutorial session with the students. Next. So in the end, we have these uh, seven columns of uh, seven uh, tools to quantify the goodness according to their, their cultural background and their common interest. Next. So how good are we become? How breathable are we? How huggable are we? How tailored are we? How trustable are we? How engaging are we? How intriguing are we? And how prolonged are we? And interestingly, it's like the students, because in the beginning, we thought quantification should start with some easy task, but the students, they all choose this uh, very soft and uh, not so easy to quantify, uh, quantify task, which is, uh, which is good exploration for us because uh, uh, sooner or later, we have to touch upon this uh, more soft, more human side of the quantification task. We can we can not only talk about uh, the sun hours of uh, facade uh, forever to say this is what we want to quantify as how good are we next. <clears throat> so think back to the examples that we were showing of Google and Autodesk's uh, new generation of design tools and imagine that instead of a GFA slider or facade or construction cost slider, you could also have one on huggability and you could measure your buildings in their engagingness to the, to the public and so on. That yeah. what we were looking for here is to develop mechanisms to quantify those kind of maybe subjective and soft parameters uh, in the same way or in a comparable matter to um, standardized um, or maybe more objectively measurable um, parameters such mm -hmm. as flow area. Next. So also we have one test site for the students. So it's like one of this building in on the Tsinghua campus. And we try to ask the students to like, according to you, what is good? Can you already quantify what, how good is the existing situation? And can you redesign the existing situation according to your uh, making use of your tool to maximize the performance of, your, of, the, of the situation? Next. So we allow the students to choose from three scales. So first you have this neighborhood scale consists of this uh, small, a, a few streets, a, a few parks, and the, a few buildings. Or you can choose the whole building, or you can choose a unit of the building. So I will show three examples. So first one is how intriguing are we? This is about the neighborhood uh, scale. So they are, they are considering um, for, for a neighborhood, like what is the layout of buildings and how to arrange the streets to make it uh make it more uh suggesting events to happen uh, next so so for other groups we are trying to use this so-called uh, metagram to map out what is their uh, roadmap to of the quantification so on the left side you have to define your input and on the right side you have to de uh, define what are what is your quantification goal so starting from the goals, like here, for example, here is they want to quantify the visual con continuity and the contrast. And then they have to define what, what input information they need to know. And the, in, the, in the middle part is about sketching the relationship between different parameters until you can finally uh, quantify, get your evaluation results. Next. Yeah. So, so here is an example that they are using the technique of heat maps to, to give the situation different score at different, uh, different spots. So the first row is about the existing site situation. So it's about the circulation network and also about the activity. So the more red reddish, the more intense you have activities or circulation network. 
And then accordingly, uh, they also redesign by making use of this tool, like this uh, lower row is their intervention design. And then they put some, uh, you, you can see they cut some buildings into two parts and make some shortcuts. So they increase the circulation and then they also put some uh, attractions on the, on the side to increase the activities to happen. So by doing this, they are uh, trying to enhance the score of the design. Next. Yeah, so here is a step of the uh, design step. So in the beginning, you don't have anything. And then they start to add more and more interventions to make the performance better according to their tool. So the next one is about uh, uh, street scale, how engaging are we? And they are mainly choosing uh, to facade, the facade. So on the left side, they think it's uh, not so engaging because it's very flat and people do not see each other uh, that often. And on the right side, by doing this uh, loggia and this, uh, this uh, corridor, like the people in the building have a much more dynamic connection to the, to the, people, the other people on the ground level. So by having this hypothesis, similarly, they develop this uh, meta diagram. So for the evaluation, they want to quantify the visual interaction and the physical interaction. And then for the input, they split the part in, into, into the side part and the street part. And uh, they are quantifying, for example, here, they are, they are uh, slicing the street into a lot of sections and they are quantifying the visual interactions between the two facades and giving them a score. And here you have a list of all the sections they take. And next, accordingly, they did the counter design. And by making this uh, uh, section like push in and out more, and they are arguing that the engagement score is growing because the visual and physical connections are much more dynamic. Next. So here is a before and after comparison. And the next example is uh, interior scale. So this, this group is, has a very interesting thing. It's about how huggable are we, especially in this uh, corona time that you don't easily have physical connection with uh, objects. So they are considering different uh, 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 levels of this uh, huggable. And, and uh, here there's a haptic score, a puffiness score, an embracement score, and accordingly they make the input for the uh, material and the surface curvature and the building density. And here in the end, next, mainly they are considering the curvature of the interior surface. So, so they, they did some uh, tests and and on the right side, on the left side, you have the input of the parameters. On the right side, you have the evaluation output of your design. And they are arguing, with, trying to argue that with the numbers, you can prove the, their design proposal is more huggable than the existing situation. Next. <clears throat> yeah, so again, a before and after comparison. And, uh, and I think for us, uh, the, the question we ask the students, maybe it's more interesting than the result of the student because in the end it's only a three week uh, workshop and the task is very challenging because the students choose this uh, very soft, uh, not so easy to quantify task. Next. <coughs> yeah, so these are the, how good are we workshop? Mm -hmm. Yes, and then uh, as a last example that we want to show is um, maybe more, more experimental and um, larger scale research project that we developed together with um, four computer science uh, students from Theo Delft, bachelor students. And it's a project called Planets Painter. It was a two months collaboration, uh, which basically aimed to develop or conceptualize a software which is an inter interactive Earth Explorer that quantifies features in satellite imagery and then visualizes design scenarios in real time. So you can imagine it like a Google Earth in which you can quantify objects on the planet and then in which you can also draw and paint over it and create new scenarios. And in this prototype, 
what we looked at is um, like first can we develop a mechanism or a software which can design on the planetary scale so make scenarios on any location on the planet and therefore we went um, with satellite image and can we then also compare regions towards each other and maybe in the future one thing that would be, would be interesting us is also can we compare developments over time which was not implemented in this first version that i'm going to show now um, at the same time, of course, if we were talking about quantification of these kind of scenarios, and if you want to see the impact of more roads, more trees, uh, less buildings, more buildings, we also need to see, especially with vegetation, um, that this impact, of course, is not the same all over the planet. So we also consider um, biomes within this. And we can see that there are a lot of precedents, for, especially in the fields of remote sensing and computer vision um, and satellite imagery, that do this with commercial interest. But uh, none that um, most of, or let's say, all of them are focused on measuring and quantifying what is there and extrapolating future trends out of that. So none of them were applicable or usable in our context where we want to look into scenario making. So as designers, we don't want to only forecast trends and developments, but we also want to think um, alt about alternatives to these trends. So the Planet Painter software that we, uh, or that this, the computer science students developed, um, consists out of four sections, out of data collection and acquisition, out of different detection modules, then out of synthesized modules to create the scenarios, and then out of in, in integration or an export uh, of this into more common formats in GIS, for example, like QGIS and ArcGIS. <clears throat> the, as, as you can see, the software architecture diagrams become a bit more complex when working with computer scientists, um, but in principle, we limited it to tree detection systems. We wanted to quantify in a given region um, the amount of trees. We wanted to quantify the amount of cars that are parked uh, on sidewalks. And we wanted to qu quantify the amount of uh, buildings, uh, building footprint and uh, roof area. And, for, and then similarly, we also limited it to in this prototype to tree scenarios, where we wanted to be able to add and remove trees from, a, from an area. We wanted to swap the amount of uh, swap cars for trees and we wanted to add green to rooftops um, for irrigation and uh, albedo effects and so on so here you can see um, the prototype in action how that was working and then most importantly we also wanted to know of course we wanted to quantify this we wanted to measure what does a scenario offer and what does it cost and for this we um, developed three criteria in the in the context of the prototype the first one is like, what can we, how much can we add in terms of biomass? How much carbon can be stored in an alternative scenario for an area on the planet? Um, and for this, as I was mentioning, we looked into uh, existing data sets for carbon storage um, by, that are biome specific, uh, and um, then converted this data in GIS, you know, in a proprietary or custom data format for the Planet Painter software. The second feature that we were interested in is air quality. So how much um, CO2 will be emitted by the features, trees, buildings, and cars, and how much um, of this can be then sequestered by, for example, new trees. And you can see here then <clears throat> the two case studies of Rotterdam and of Shanghai. In the first step, which was um, the Planet Painter collects aerial or satellite footage from Google, I think from Google, um, Google Earth services. In the second step, it runs detections on this. So we can see that in this area of Shanghai, um, three different neural networks detect uh, 14,600 trees, 4,500 cars, and uh, approximately 4 million square meters of rooftops. And of course, these um, these numbers might not be fully accurate, which has, uh, as I mentioned, it's a prototype, it's a, it's a test. And uh, as you would train neural networks um, with larger data sets, of course, accuracy would, um, would, would increase. But here, the main purpose was really to test the mechanisms of such, an, of such a speculative software and how designers would, uh, would or could interact with it. Here we can see then uh, a scenario where 25% of trees were added 50% of cars were replaced or swapped with trees, and 50% uh, of rooftops were, of Shanghai would be covered in green. And then we can measure uh, again for each of these places uh, what that would give in performance, how much biomass would be added to it, how many uh, cars would be freed from the streets, and so on. 
And then in the last step, uh, this software was linked to GIS, which is uh, the default uh, format in which urban planners at MBIDB work. Here we have a quick uh, video of um, how the software was um, programmed and how it was operating. I'll click through this a bit since we're a bit over time already. Um, you choose an area. You need um, an API key for Google locations, which shows you your ratio here in how many images you already have requested from Google services. And then uh, it starts to download those images uh, onto your server. So once you have them there, you don't need to uh, connect to Google anymore. And then it runs detections rather fast through these three different neural networks. Oops. I think I just, yeah. And then the next step allows you to make these scenarios and modifications through three simple sliders. Okay, so I think this is um, this is the end of the talk for now. You can find more information on our website next.mvdv.com. And of course, if this uh, interests you, or if you have any questions that we um, that go beyond the scope of this uh, webinar, you can get in touch with us at the email address below next.mvdv.com. And yeah, we hope we showed you a bit the challenges that we face and the excitement that we can also um, see in especially projects like the Solarscape in visualizing like the kind of uh, data cloud that surrounds the city through existing spatial features, building policies, and of course, also design intent from architects and urbanists. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yagreen. Thank you, Leo. Um, you guys are very quiet today. There's no questions so far in the chat, but uh, I will maybe start and um, as more questions and bubbles flows up, um, feel free to ping us in the chat section and I'll help moderate. Um, Leo, I, I would like to start with this question. Did you think, do you think how good, how good are we, is the question answered most of the time? Are you satisfied with um, the evaluations and inputs that you help build this project with? Um, no, absolutely not. I think it's really a starting point in which we just want to open this as a discussion. And I mean, what, what we see is that uh, the moment that that um, design impact is quantified and packaged in a slick software interface and with a kind of number on it, it suggests that there's, a, there's some truth to that, right? And yeah. uh, on the one hand, it makes the processes that do quantify it uh, in a way obscure, like you don't, if you download the software and you use it and you don't design it yourself, you don't really know how a score is um, calculated. And at the same time, you do trust it because of the visual kind of strictness that is implied in user interfaces and so on. So I think what we want to um, open up with the, especially with this research together that we did together with Singwa, is on the one hand, the question, are these seven or eight parameters that reoccur from Google to Autodesk to even our own design tools really the only ones that matter? And at the same time, also, if they are the most important ones, uh, is it actually agreed on how we calculate them? So if we measure the uh, quantify the performance in terms of views in an apartment, do we even agree on what is a good view and what is a bad view? Like, how do you measure that algorithmically, geometrically, essentially? Yeah, and when you are seeking answers for those questions, were there any incidences where you find that um, the current technology or computational power is allowing us to do more, for example, to allow particip participatory design from the public? Yes, I mean, that's something where I have to say we have um, speculated on that more than that we actually developed it. So we have prototypes for um, collaborative and also participatory design software. We did a competition in Grasbrook in Hamburg for a master plan where we proposed as MBIDV together with Next a participatory game as a way to design that master plan, which is heavily based on quantification of the design context, but also allows for input and um, special features uh, that can be added by people. There's a longer article about this on our website if, if someone is interested in that. But generally, I think um, we are excited in some from the moment that you look at these, especially larger scale urban models and this kind of data clouds that you can draw 
on them that there's some form of um, a softness to data that is that has been that that where things are not black or white you no know? and where there may be also especially in projects like the last one with the um, neural networks where you go towards probabilities rather than absolute scores so if a neural network would give an um, evaluated design it would um, there's a certainty towards it but it will never be a 100% score a neural network would say said the, in in terms of machine learning you usually talk about confidence so a neural network is 70% confident that this is a good view and i think so that we can see that as the or my personal belief is as this, these systems and the amount of information that we engage with is becoming more complex that in a way it also becomes more fuzzy and more open to interpretation again yeah that's an amazing attitude to have and i think a lot of the times when we try to complete a project as all architects do have this sense of you know wrapping wrapping it up and present it as is but i think making it more an open question maybe to provoke more uh, successful projects to come is far more important. This reminds me that, you know, it's officially the 20th year's anniversary for Pharmax, I think. It's, yeah. It reminds me of how old I am. Um, and within <laughs> the 20 years, um, how, how amazing it is for our generation to witness um, the advancements of technology and computation, computational capacity um, in your practice, um, do you mind sharing maybe some of the highlights where you, you, you feel, wow, you know, with this tool or with this new development, either in gaming or visualization or however it is that really changed the game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you highlights. Do you want to mention? I mean, like, <laughs> or maybe, maybe I said, like, I mean, I think for me, I would say that the Solarscape, that's also why we put it as a cover and that's why we um, talk about it extensively, is something that you have to keep in mind that as MBRDB next, so for the part of the thing, projects that we were showing, it's a rather short term, it's like I think three years uh, that we've been operating as uh, MBRDB next. I think within that time, this project for me is a highlight because it very much is rooted within the ideas of the early MBRDB, Meta City, Data Town, and Pharmax of visualizing potentials. And at the same time, it was really something that um, at this scale is also relying on technological advancements, for instance, on the, on the, on the fact that nowadays most cities, at, at least in Europe and I guess in the US, have 3D models and are collecting this, in, this digital twin of their um, physical um, territory. So this is something that uh, on the level on which it was executed in Solarscape, but this precision would not have been possible to do even five, six, seven years ago. And at the same time, when we were presenting this to the municipality, they were fascinated with it because it became, um, because through the Solarscape approach, it became a spatial project again. So they were like, yes, we're talking about this in politics and in political terms, and we're talking about it in rather abstract terms of maybe a 2D plan and saying this is an area that should be protected from shadow, but um, neither developer nor the policymaker could um, envision the effects of these policies, right? Like you de designate an area that it should be protected from shadow for future developments. And it could be that this has nothing, no impact whatsoever on uh, adjacent high rises, or it could also mean that it makes it come any form of future developments completely unfeasible. So I think that um, this is, in that sense, this is a, for us a really meaningful project that we can see as architects and urbanists, we can play this um, also on a, or maybe also as software designers, we can play this kind of role of mediating between um, still a way of moving and redesigning the city, but doing that in a responsible way and uh, visualizing, yeah, poli building policies, like kind of rather invisible um, processes. Mm -hmm. And the same question to Yaiwing. What are some yeah. of the things that you felt that's like a, a, a moment of change? Yeah, I think I totally agree with Leo that this project is the most significant milestone in the history of short short history of family next because also like in the in the in the introduction of the uh, uh the workshop is how good are we to the students like because uh when, when you google parametric design like most stuff you see is like the manipulating is the form by this parametric tool but what we do it differently here at MRDV is like we pay more attention to the to the data to the evaluation part, and uh, we don't uh, uh, easily get abused 
get addicted to the to the forms. And I think this project is like a typical project that we 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 use the methodology of uh, Pharmax again to emphasize on uh like it's almost like mining in this data like to visualize the data and to see from there what you can do from there but not immediately dive into the forms mm -hmm. got it okay we'll start with some of the questions in chat um <clears throat> from vera what would what would be the most difficult part when you transform the generative ge uh, geometries to more aesthetic driven forms? And I think that's a very valid question. As um, I think a very essential part of the architect's role is form finding um, with all of these possibilities um, given by the model, how do you, um, like, does it propose some of the you know, more challenges for you to make a decision in terms of aesthetic choices? Yeah, uh, I, I, so I just had to open the chat now. I can also read along. Um, yes, so I think, I mean, this was quite, maybe quite clear in, um, we tried to, to talk about this in the context of Valley specifically, but also then of the intent sense that um, we, I guess at this point within MBADV do not believe in uh, full on optimization or computer generated um, solutions as like the final result. But that whenever we conceptualize these kind of scripts, it is always um, important to focus on or to leave some breakpoints where a designer can interfere and can manipulate results before they get passed on to the next step of an algorithm. So even in projects that rely more on computational solutions, uh, we don't usually develop one software that does it all, but it's more, rather like broken up into smaller steps. So one script that would initially generate the first part and analyze it, then leave some space for manual interference of designers. And then those results will be passed on to the next step. So I think that's something that uh, also given the fact that we are not a tech company, but an architectural company is very important that we leave this space to the architectural design teams. Mm. And the next question is coming from Hubert, Herbert, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Um, thank you so much, Leo and Yayun, for the presentation. Um, the question is two parts. One, could you share with us a little bit more about the process from backend programming with regard to Next to the interface and the actual general user? Uh, what pr program do you use? We saw some Revit, Rhino, Grasshopper, um, the classic trail, and how are the designers within Next interact uh, with together with the team? Hmm. Yeah, really good uh, question. Um, maybe good to know that at this point, all five of us at MBDV Next, we are, have a background as architects and urbanists. We have a fascination in scripting, but none of us is a computer scientist or a programmer. So we are also gradually improving or professionalizing these workflows. The main tool still for us is Grasshopper with all of its extensions. And we also develop custom plugins um, for the use within MBDV and Dubai Factory. Um, so in the beginnings, exchange or collaboration within Next was mainly on the level of breaking up um, Grasshopper scripts into smaller parts in which we collaborate. So we have a template for that and the co coding conventions, I guess, for visual programming, uh, which allow us to break up larger workflows into smaller chunks that can be developed by separate people. But nowadays, we're also going more and more into GitHub and um, like proper process protocols for um, for versioning of computer code. Um, in terms of programs, in addition to Revit Dynamo, Rhino Grasshopper, we've been doing a lot in QGIS um, and uh, ArcGIS with different extensions. And we're more and more also now at the moment looking into game engines, which is especially useful like Unity uh, primarily, but a bit of Unreal Engine, which is very interesting for us because with these engines, you can, as we talked about uh, earlier, you can go more into also interactive um, and real-time solutions, yeah. which is something that we've been conceptualizing a lot. And But usually it remained on the level of designing a UI for general designers or, um, or users and then animating that in After Effects or, um, or in Photoshop to just see how would, maybe more being interested in how would these interactions work than actually developing them uh, all the way through. 
Mm-hmm. But uh, as I said, at the moment, we, we're developing something in Unity for, for an exhibition uh, that we will have, I think, opening in a, in a few weeks at the Neue Institute. And it's fast, fascinating to see how fast you can mock up some prototype with actually functioning buttons and so on. Yeah. And yeah. the second question, um, I, actually, this question is great because it ties into one of our previous talks on AI with the MIT Media Lab, um, Dr. Uh, Zheng Hao. Uh, at the end of the talk proposed this scenario in which in the near future architects are no longer form givers, they're more like trainers of AI and they give criteria to the computational model and, and take it from there. Um, the second question from uh, Yvette is, do you see the computation in computational design, the decision makers in this case, um, maybe your, your boss or uh, the team leaders? Mm-hmm. Um, can sh- make that shift between the role of form givers to the AI trainers or criteria givers. Right, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's in a way, I guess, like the one of the main discussion points at the moment with this uh, software paradigm shift from, uh, from a kind of traditional algorithms towards machine learning, right? Where you can say that in a way, the design of a software architecture of neural networks is so complex that architects will probably for the next few years, not understand it enough. So then the only thing that remains is to select the input data and curate um, what information neural networks are trained on. I think, I mean, that's a discussion that goes also outside of architecture and um, and urbanism. I think at this point, we would see this more as a speculation and I'm not sure if it's a desirable one. I would think not. I would think um, I'm too much of an architect to like, <laughs> purely see myself as like collecting and filtering, but of course it's likely, or we see that generally the role of data and information that you have in a project is a lot more important. Um, and I guess this also taps into, you know, maybe in a softer way into this kind of provocation that we asked in the beginning of the presentation of, is the spreadsheet worth more than, than the sketch, right? Yeah. So yeah, looking at the question written, I don't know if this shift is happening with our boss or internally within the practice but maybe it's but it's certainly happening in the context of if you see a developer or a client as a boss <laughs> that um that uh who in the end is maybe the ultimate <laughs> form giver in a in a real building process uh that there we can see that for for example tools that we were showing like the delft tool and so on that um that these kind of tools are used by clients as well and that they would might compare feasibility results or design concepts that we as architects uh, develop to solutions that are auto generated by neural networks within these platforms mm-hmm. and so in, the, in the end the number will be the boss <laughs> the developers they also look at the numbers <laughs> um and the next question comes from bing how with offices in three, four different countries and cities. Um, outside of the Netherlands, have you been able to incorporate your practice with munis- munis- municipalities and their uh, local regulations on a uh, urban planning level? Um, you mean like direct collaborations with municipalities? This is something that we, uh, at least within Next, have only started now with the, with the SolarScape research. However, that is that research is something that is um, not only relevant in the Dutch context. Like we actually, the way that we started with this is just because it was a reoccurring question within design projects from different studios within MBRDB. So we had projects in Czech Republic where the question was, how can we design dense areas with uh, while abiding to daylight regulations, local daylight regulations, and the same in Germany, Netherlands. So these these kind of things are popping up more and more, and it's just a matter of speed which um, municipalities adopted more quickly. So, but I think in terms of a direct collaboration, at the moment we only do this with uh, Dutch municipalities. I see, and same within China, yeah. You do you see that the Chinese municipalities and local government are they more? Um, are they embracing this idea of uh, inviting global practices to engage or? Yeah, we, we would like to, but uh, you know, the, the, in China, things are a bit more complicated because things are way less transparent than here in the Netherlands. Like for example, in the, in the example of Tencent, like because it's such a big project, so it's no longer a, only a, a, a simple private project. So we are also using this uh, methodology 
to not only show to Pony Ma, but also the mayor of uh, Shen of Shenzhen and of Shanghai as well. Like when they have, uh, so what we are proposing is not a fixed design, but a rather flexible system. So when they have questions, like, can you do a bit here and there to change a step back or a step forward? We can always show this is a flexible system that you can adjust uh, depending on the situation. So I think uh, uh, in general, they are interested in this kind of method, but in, in China, they are also really uh, want to see a fixed design proposal. They don't want to play the uh, sliders by themselves. So mm. that, that, that's a bit different in, in, mm. than in, in here. I think that's a really important point that um, yeah. you just touched on that. I think, I mean, as we were showing, even in the early um, visions of MVRDV before, before MVRDV mm -hmm. in the village maker, house maker and so on, there was always um, a fascination for, for in, a, in a way, a form of participatory design. And so like a high flexibility, true computational tools, in a way, designing a full uh, uh, or changing a design of a project in the meeting with a client or in the meeting with, um, with the future mm -hmm. residents or in a meeting with the municipality. And what we did find out is that um, none of these uh, user groups in a way is ready for that. And I guess that's really true pretty much all over the world that if you take it out of an academic context, people are like overwhelmed the moment you give them the, pos the possibility to design themselves, even if that just means uh, dragging some sliders. So um, looking at the second part of the question by Bing Gao Li um, on how people respond to the rational or quantitative approach that is usually um, very receptive. I think in all cases, uh, if you give people numbers, it suggests that you know what you're doing and that you're in control of it. So that part they like, the moment that it goes into, we can give you not only the numbers for this design, but we can show you a lot of different designs with different numbers. Usually they're like, okay, uh, just show me the best one. You know, like, I don't, I don't wanna know about it. So that's, um, that's something where, where this kind of flexibility maybe is not yet, um, it's something that we appreciate a lot within the office, but that is hard to to get, um, to not overwhelm clients with that, I would say. But of course, as um, as Yayun was showing, especially in the context of Tencent, it was really important if you work with such complex geometries to be able to convince a client who might say, oh, this is not buildable, or it looks very, very, um, like lots of special and uh, exceptions and special features to actually then convince them in numbers and say, but it's quite standardized and there are only this in this amount of unique facade panels and so on. So then this rationale is very important in, a, in the decision-making process. Yeah, since we're doing so great on time and we'll definitely allow this follow-up question, which makes me suspect that maybe Mr. Lee is a client. <laughs> Another question, is mm -hmm. Next Team's members time build as projects, uh, two projects or as office overhead. Uh, yeah. How do you evaluate ROI on the uh, MBRDV next development? Yeah, no, I mean, that's like these kind of questions in the end, they're probably the most important if you want to reflect about it in terms of, of practice. And this is something again, that we are also just figuring out as, as we go. Um, initially we were hired, all of us were hired as architects in the first place and we work in, in architectural projects. And so most of the more practical tools that we were showing now, like really applied workflows that are useful within one project, those are usually um, built on the project uh, development. And that's, of course, something where we make, we develop a quick proposal for a new workflow. Um, this, um, the kind of conceptualization of that, or I guess you could call it a feasibility study of the tool. That's something that we invest in within MBRDB. And then we discuss with a client if they want to go that way. Um, and if yes, we, we, de we develop the tool on the project hours. Mm -hmm. The research projects um, that you saw, those are part of office overhead. And that's something where we have a fixed budget for research and development in budget in terms of hours that we can invest in it. And we have a rather democratic process within Next in which we collect different topics and different directions that we think are relevant and then evaluate um, success for each of them and the relevance, of course, are these tools needed or not? And at the moment we do um, four research camps of two weeks per year. I see. In which we develop more experimental things like the solar scape, for example. I see. And are there um, requests as a standalone research project that's paid by project as well? 
Um, yes, yeah. I mean, yeah, we do that both in, I guess, standalone research projects that are paid. This, oh, wait, okay. So that's something that we're still hoping for. <laughs> At this point, we had uh, we only had one so far, which was a research into MBRDB's uh, digital archive and mainly into um, finding ways to access 3D models uh, of, the, of that archive. So as I mentioned, we have now around 1,100 projects um, created over the course of the last almost uh, 30 years. So that's a, a huge amount of data, and especially on the level of 3D models where software has developed so fast. There was um, a request by, the, by a public institution uh, on how can we look into architectural archives and into like making these kind of models accessible to larger public and comparable and quantifiable. So that was a research camp that was paid. But most of them, as I said, they are things that we observe in design projects, where we uh, in architectural projects, where we say this is actually really important. We would need a more stable tool for it. And then it is for now. It's there are investments by MBRDB. The latest one that we are about to launch next week, for instance, is a carbon quantification tool, where we build our own tool again with the ambition to understand how does carbon modeling work and how do carbon predictions work, and can we move this from the traditional assessments that happen in late DD and execution stages to the earliest concept design. So can we essentially like evaluate the carbon footprint of a building in the level of a sketch? And so these kind of tools are very specific then to MBRDV's design methodology as well. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, with that, maybe we'll move on to the last question of today's session um, from Jun Wang. Uh, what kind of technology, digital tools, or innovation do you foresee as most important uh, to be developed in the next five years, looking into the future? And what kind of obstacles do you think are important to overcome? It's a great question to close out this. It's a really good uh, last question. Yeah. And uh, in a way, you would want to open that to everyone. Yes. <laughs> I would be probably more curious to hear um, um, participants' uh, speculations on that. Because I guess in at the at this moment in technology, anyone who speculates five years in the future can only be wrong about this. You know, <laughs> things are changing so fast. Yeah. Um. I don't know. I think. Yeah. You should I start? Or I I would say. Maybe yeah. from my side, I would think that the main technological innovations that are needed are on the level of collaboration. I think that's probably that there's a lot happening, of course, already on this level of BIM, for example, rationalization of architectural design processes. But uh, I would be interested or hope that uh, there will be a lot of innovation happening on seeing how to involve other actors um, within design processes. So can we collaborate um, with um, philosophers? Can we collaborate with, uh, I don't know, a design context with also with non maybe non-human design parameters as we were showing these kind of environmental um factors like how can you make tools that are including more actors within the design process mm -hmm. but i guess in reality most innovations in the next five years will be the integration of machine learning or neural network um, um neural networks within more traditional or conventional design processes but also the like when you talk about the collaboration i think also the real-time collaboration no Mm -hmm. I think it's like the, the technology, for example, this uh, simple example is the Miro, like it's an online sketching tool that multiple people can work together, drop in their ideas, but also on this architecture design level, like think about when we develop a project, how hard, how difficult it is, like if you want to tweak this thing a little bit in Rhino or, or when it's already a diagram in, in, in design in your booklet, how difficult it is to just a tweak a, a little bit here and there. So it's like a real collaboration between people, but also between people and the user interface in the computer, I think can be the most interesting part in the next five year development. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Well, perfect. Uh, I want to thank you again, uh, Leo and Yayun, for joining us today. And thank you so much for this fantastic sharing. Uh, I think the computational uh, future for design architecture, it's an uh, open-ending uh, uh, issue or questions that we can uh, keep on exploring, uh, maybe forever. But I'm um, looking forward to the next time we, we're going to come back to uh, have another session of discussion. 
And uh, also want to thank you for uh, all the friends that join us today. And uh, it's uh, uh, to celebrate the, uh, uh, the idea exploration and the sharing. Uh, thank you so much and uh, wish everyone have a nice weekend. Thank you. Thank you for thank having you, us here. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.